Continuing now to se session number two, we want to talk about real issues, meaning val the importance of values, priorities, and character. Character, we've already emphasized that in the first session, and so we probably uh, emphasize more on the importance of values and priorities. We'll also touch a little bit on the on character. If you look at, again, you know, we're contrasting, you know, what's going on around us in society, what's going on around us in the world, in culture, and so on, and contrast that to the reality, right? In the world today, image, what you project, is so big that it has often taken, the image has taken the replaced reality. You fake it, you'll make it. <laughs> Whether you really are or not. So the image has become more important than reality. You know, whether it's right or wrong, the image you present and portray gets the work done. And so what's the result of that? The result is we've got fabricated men. Not the real man. You've got something, a perception that you've created. A fabrication. Not the reality. So many times what we see of other people, what we know of other people, it's not who they really are. It's an image that has been portrayed by their own, you know, through various means. And, and that in society, we say, we see that Relativism has replaced absolutes. Okay. It's gone. No, no longer, absolutes no longer matter. What's good for you is good for you. What's good for me is good for me. <laughs> if it's right for me, it's right. It's right for you, it's right. There are no, no longer absolutes. And, but the sad thing is it's reached a place where somebody can call a bad thing a good thing and a good thing, a bad thing, and people accept that. Nobody questions it. Bad can become good, good can become bad, and it's uh, resulting in people believing a lie rather than embracing truth. And so society is really saying, I want God to fit into my lifestyle rather than saying, I want my lifestyle to adhere to God's standards, you know? So that's the challenge. And as believers, you know, we are confronted with this. You know, whether it's in your school or college, for those of you in that stage of life, or those of us in the workplace, in business, you know, we are under pressure in a world where the world is saying, I want God to fit into my, what my standards are. I'm not going to get my standards up to God's. And that's a big, big challenge. Pressure for all of us as believers. So, we, you and I, must choose to live by a higher level where for us, truth and reality matter. So that's the call now. For us as men, you know, there are three identities we deal with. The man I want other people to think about, think I am. The man, the man he wants others to think he is, the man he thinks he is, and the man he really is. Three different identities. But if all these can converge, coincide, and we have one single identity, that's, that's the place of peace. That's reality. So I'm not creating one image for other people to think about me. One image I have in my mind of myself and reality is something else. No. If all these three are one, that's the place to be. That what other people think about me, what I think about myself and who I really am is one and the same thing. So there's no image replacing reality. It's reality in all three realms. What other people think about me, what I think about myself, and who I really am should be the same. 
You know, the Bible tells us, 1 Corinthians 5, 11, don't keep company with anybody who is an idolater. Now, I understand in Bible times, idolatry was practiced literally. And in, in some situations, yes, it's practiced literally today as well. But I want us to think about this, that sometimes the image, the wrong image we create can become an idol to us. And the wrong perception that we create about ourselves, the image that we create, becomes an idol for us. Because that's what we want to be. That's what we want to portray. I need to maintain my image. Something I want other people to think about me. But your image, or sometimes we have many images that we want to portray to people, right? And that image could become an idol to me, to us, in our own mind, a false image. And then we are controlled, we are overcome by this false image that we are trying to portray to people. So we got to be careful about for that. So, values. Page eight, please. Values. You know, when God created us in his own image, he endowed us with these five unique characteristics, abilities as people. We have, we have, we have, as people, we have the capacity to know the truth. We have the ability to recognize moral excellence, what's right, what's wrong. We have the power to choose, to exercise our will. We have creative power in our words. Our words are very important, very powerful. And we have the ability to procreate, to reproduce. And for a Christ-like man, we use all these Abilities, these five characteristics God has given us, we use them for the glory of God. We use them for the will of God. These are governed by certain values and priorities. They're not exercised or let go randomly, use it every... No, no, no. God has given all of you, each one of us, these abilities, these five characteristics. And then these are governed by values and priorities that we maintain in our lives. We see in, by, in, the, in the scripture, we see men like David, who, David and Daniel, and we know their stories, how they were man, men of character, values, priorities. David, amazing life, man after God's own heart. His early lives was tough, being chased by Saul living in caves. I mean, he knew God had called him to be king. He was anointed by Samuel. Wonderful future, but tough, tough life, running in the caves. And he refused to retaliate. That's, that's character. He refused to retaliate. Day, Saul is after his life. So his early days was tough. But the time came. He stepped into his calling, God orchestrated it, became king of Judah, king of all Israel, had a wonderful reign. God blessed that reign, 30 years. Did amazing. He's, he's one of the patriarchs. People are proud. Abraham, David, proud of the heritage. No king like David. Brought the whole land in control. Set everything in place. Built the tabernacle. A, a God worship going on. And it's just amazing. Beautiful, beautiful. Now, he did make mistakes. But as a man of character, he repented. He got back to God. He made a mistake. It was the latter part of his, his reign. We know he sinned with Bathsheba, killed Uriah. But he repented. So, a godly man lived a godly life, made mistakes, but he knew how to repent, get back, his, get right before God and continue his journey. Daniel, amazing life, under a lot of pressure throughout his uh, time, but he stood, he stood for things. He stood for what he believed. Uh, under three different empires, he stood. Under the Babylonians, 
the Medes and Persians, uh, he stood. Didn't compromise his values. So, we have to decide, are we going to be people who live by convenience or preference, or are we going to live by conviction? We have to decide. Daniel's example, he was a man who lived by conviction, not by convenience. It would have been very convenient for him and his friends, you know, so many, so many occasions. Bow to the idol, compromise with the people, sorry. Uh, do all those things, but he chose not to. And yes, there's some interesting things to think about. The three differences between preference and conviction. People who live by preference can be negotiated out of their preferences. Convictions are non-negotiable. Well, stop. I made up my mind. You can't negotiate on this. Sorry. Second, people who live by preference or convenience, they weaken under pressure. Convictions grow. Pressure only serves to strengthen our convictions. So, you and I face pressure. Maybe, you know, for those of you in school, college, school, college, there's pressure. Workplace pressure, society pressure. What does this pressure do to you? Does it make you compromise on your conviction or does it make you strengthen your conviction? So that's the acid test. That's when you and I can tell that I have certain convictions or these are just preferences which I'm willing to negotiate if I'm under pressure. Because convictions are strengthened under pressure. So we're not afraid of pressure. We're not afraid of being challenged for what we believe. You challenge it, I'm going to stand by it stronger. It's only going to become stronger. And we must also understand this, that people who live by preferences, they dislike and they fight against those who hold to convictions. You live by preferences, you stand by convictions, those who live by preferences are going to attack those who live by convictions. So, what did Jesus do? He's our model. He lived by convictions. Nothing could change that. Nothing could change that. Sometimes even his own disciples didn't understand some of his convictions. When he told them, I have to go to the cross. His own disciples wanted to talk him out of it. Not, not, not in a bad way, but because they didn't understand. Right? They didn't understand. But just know, that's the purpose. That's what I've call, I'm come for. I'm going to the cross. So Jesus lived by his convictions. So, don't let convictions yield to convenience. Can your convictions must not yield to convenience. There will be pressure, but you and I are standing by our convictions. And so this is where moral courage is needed. We need to be courageous, not cowards. Cowards shrink from danger. They shrink from duty. They shrink from the thought of pain and pressure, and they yield to fear. The fear of man is a form of moral cowardice, and, and that's what ruins manhood. So we need to be courageous to stand by our convictions and not let anything rob us of being Christ-like men. Now, here are some very important things that we must understand about values and priorities, about eight things, eight statements we'll make. Important things about values and priorities. Number one, bottom of, bottom of page eight. Number one, some 
things are more important than life itself. Some things are more important than life itself. Or you can put it like this. Some things you've got to give your life for. Or some things you've got to die for. There are certain values and priorities that are more important than life itself. Think about Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Bow to the idol or... Fire, death. Hey, it's a life or death situation. You stand by your values, you stand by your priorities. Death, you can conveniently bow to the image, you can live. But they said, our values, our priorities right now are so important, we are willing to die for it. Some values, some priorities are more important than life. I cannot compromise. Non-negotiable. If I die, I die. That's how important these values. This is what I stand for. I'm willing to die for it. Page number nine, second understanding about values and priorities. The intangible is more important than the tangible. You gotta understand that. It's difficult to live by that, but that's reality, that's truth. The internal is more important than the external. The unseen is more important than the seen. The spirit is more important than the body. In life, there are some things where the intangible is more important than the tangible. Example. The honor or the respect that you have is more important than a tangible. You can say, example, money. Money you can earn. Respect has to be earned, but if it's lost, it's very hard to regain. Respect is intangible. Money is tangible. So in life, certain things are intangible, but they are more valuable than the tangible. Number three. Money clarifies your values and we're not taking offering today. <laughs> That's not the point. We're just establishing values and priorities. Okay? We tend to invest money in what we value most. Jesus put it like this. In Matthew 6, 21, we know this. He said, where your treasure is, your heart will lose. It shows. Where you're putting your treasure shows. It shows where your heart is. Where your treasure is, your heart will be there. Right? So Jesus taught us that. So our, the condition of our heart is expressed through the attitude that we carry towards money. I don't know what things were discussed on your tables, but in our table, wealth, money was an issue. You know, I mean, that's how the world portrays yeah, your man, you got it, you got money, you got wealth. That's one of the things that talk about. But really, what do you and I do? How do we handle wealth? What's our view of wealth? Do we use it as a, see it as a means by which we can do God's will and bless people and carry out whatever God's called us to do? Or is the money controlling us? So the use of money is the asset test of character in a real man. How do you handle it? How do you use it? It shows our character. You know, when Jesus gave that, and this is in Luke 16, when he gave the story of the unjust steward, the man who didn't manage his uh, master's business properly, he went on to say, if you and I are not faithful in the unrighteous mammon, talking about money, 
who will commit to you true riches? Yes. If you can be faithful in handling money, then you can also be trusted with true riches, with eternal things, that God himself is looking at it like that. If God sees you faithful in money, he says, I can trust this man with things of my kingdom. I can trust him with true riches. So Jesus put it like that. The real man doesn't rely on riches, but on God. I mean, we know money is given to us by God. We rely on God. We are not trusting in money. And we give because when we give, we know that there's a gain which cannot be obtained any other way. Number four, and we're talking about values and priorities. Whatever dictates your values becomes your God. Who is your God? Who is dictating your values? Our values can be dictated by heaven or our values can be dictated by earth. The Bible tells us, Colossians 3, 1, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. That means my affections are on God there and he's dictating my values. Set your affection on things above. Not on things on the earth. So who is dictating your values? Who is dictating? That's a true test. Your values, priorities. Number five. And this is something for us to think about. Individual rights cannot exceed the corporate good. So in my understanding, in our understanding of values, priorities... My individual right cannot exceed the corporate good. That means the value of the whole is more important than just my own the value of the one. So that means I cannot say I want to exercise my right and compromise the good of everyone else. I have to take into account the good of everybody else in the exercise of my liberties, in the exercise of my rights. But, this is, but the, the world around us got upside down. You, it's your right. You live the way you want. Don't worry about how it impacts or affects people around you. It's your right. And we saw all of this happen during COVID. It was so funny. Right? Uh, where you thought, you know, you just need a little common sense to think about the good of everybody. Right? You're not thinking about your personal right. That's submitted to the good of everybody. Right? But it became such a big battle on what you would think is simple common sense. Became a huge issue. Sometimes big, big issues. Just forgetting that individual rights cannot exceed the corporate. Good. You all with me? Number six. And we're getting a little closer to home. It says, fathers provide the family's value system. This is very important. So... What happens in the home, the value system in the home, the main person is the father, the man in the house. And this is especially important for us, those of us who are married, who have families. And so understand that our responsibility is not to make our children's decisions for them, our main priority, our responsibility is to let our children see us make our decisions. And yes, of course, when they're children, you're making decisions for them. But there'll come a time when they need to see you make the decisions. And that's how they're going to learn. They're going to see you live by values and priorities. And that's what they're going to follow. And so the biblical pattern is, in, the, in discipling the family, 
The pastor disciples the man, and the man disciples the family. Means we serve the men who are then serving their own families. Number seven, values can be held and then discarded. That means just because there are values that you and I hold on today, we've got to be careful to guard it because if we're not careful, we could discard it tomorrow. And Jesus said, Luke 9, 62, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of heaven. And it's, you've got your hands on the plow today, good, but you've got to stay there tomorrow. You can't just look back. You can't turn back. So values have to be held on to. They've got to be protected. They've got to be guarded. Otherwise, there's a risk of losing them, being discarded. Last one. Everything in life has value. It may be actual, it may be perceived, and it may be accrued or increased. Think about time. Time has intrinsic value. What do you do with it? If you waste it, it's lost. If you spent it, it's gone. If it's invested, it's multiplied. And we all have time. Think about influence. You have influence in wherever, wherever God has put you. You have influence. How, do you, how we use that influence will determine its value. If you use it for good, well done. If you sell it and use it for bad, you might destroy yourself and you might destroy many other people. But influence has value. There's value even in failure, so don't throw your failures away because you could use it. You could use the lessons from that for the decisions you're going to make uh, tomorrow. So, yeah, page nine, page ten. So, real man has real values and priorities. Understand the importance of values and priorities. A real man has real values and priorities. So let's talk a little bit now on this. Think about Esau. It could have been Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. Could have been. Didn't turn out that way. He had a great inheritance. We call it birthright. Birthright. Something that came to him because he was the firstborn. He had a great inheritance. But at a moment when he needed or he felt he needed to satisfy a genuine longing. I'm hungry. So being hungry is not a bad thing. It's not a sinful thing. It's a genuine longing, right? And yet, at a moment when he had to decide between something intangible, something eternal, a birthright, and something temporal, I'm hungry. He sold the intangible. He sold the birthright for a momentary gain. That's it. And it became Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So, anybody can receive an inheritance. It's given to you for free. It comes to you. But the, what you need to keep that inheritance, what you need to leverage that inheritance is something you have to obtain. The wisdom and the anointing or the grace that you need 
is something you obtain. Or you can put it like this, a ministry can be handed down to you, but the capacity to handle that ministry you have to obtain. And an inheritance can be handed down to you, but the capacity to do something with it is, some, is what you have to obtain. You have to develop values and character. A compromise of values can result in a compromise of destiny. That's what happened. A compromise of values lost his destiny. Joseph, on the other hand, we, we can see in Scripture, he stood by his values and principles and he demonstrated character. So standing by your values and your priorities is how you build character. And character is built over time. Character is built over time. Decision by decision, line upon line, little by little. It takes time, but it has enduring results. So you build character by standing by your values and your priorities. If you stand by your values, you stand by these priorities, you're going to develop strong character. You're going to build character. And what is God looking for? God commits to character. So how do we know that? Paul told Timothy, Timothy, the things that you've learned of me, commit to faithful men. He didn't say commit to gifted men, commit to anointed men, no. He said, Timothy, whatever you receive from me, you commit it to faithful men. So faithfulness is a cornerstone of character. And how is faithfulness embodied? It's embodied by constancy, loyalty, and submission. You're steadfast, you're loyal, you're submitted. It's an expression of faithfulness, and God commits to faithfulness. He commits to character. And keep, keep this in mind. We need to keep this in mind that we've got to live by truth. We value truth. Truth is priority. A half-truth is a whole lie. And no, no lie will serve the purposes of God. You cannot build something on a lie. So, the core, the inner part of us, character, requires us to live by values and hold on to our priorities. So I want us to take some time to Think about this. What are my values? What are my priorities? In a world that is so focused on creating a false perception of things. It's so focused on image, not the reality. What are my values? What are my priorities in life? Now, of course, as, as believers, we want to stand by, or we want to live by biblical values, biblical priorities, okay? And we're going to talk about that in the next session after lunch. Biblical values, biblical priorities. But the question now is, can you and I so commit to living by these values and these Priorities without compromising. That we will be people of conviction, not of preference or convenience. Right? We will talk in the next session on those values that we have to live by.